Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Menker, and I'm the founder and CEO of Grow Intelligence, an AI company that's dedicated to two verticals that are critical to humanity, food security and climate change. Oftentimes, when we speak about climate change, we speak about it as if it's something of the future, as opposed to something we are living in in a present reality. It is today. Um, and climate change has already started to disrupt multiple supply chains, ranging from our food supply chains to our energy supply chains to pretty much anything that we consume. And this talk I'm giving is really going to be focused on the impacts that climate change is having on agriculture and agricultural production and the food that we eat. And when I say climate change is now, um, you see it as evidenced by many sort of different types of data sets. If you look at what happened over the past few years, La Nina, which is an event that should not occur three years in a row, brought extremely dry conditions to South America's crops. Now, South America is now the world's largest exporter of most major sort of commodity crops. It's overtaken the U.S., but both Argentina and Brazil were overtaken by droughts in essentially 2020, 2021, and 2022. And only this year has it started to sort of come off and significantly affected production and yields. Now this year, we flipped over to what's called El Nino. So now, as South America has recovered, um, El Nino strengthening has meant that places like South Asia, Southeast Asia, have started to suffer from dry conditions. This means that things like palm oil production are being heavily impacted in regions such as Indonesia and in Malaysia, the two largest producers of palm oil in the world. And what you see here in this chart is the essentially the oscillation here that you see is this bump up is a move into this new cycle that will cause um, dryness in regions of the world that are in sort of the more of South, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Australia, et cetera, where it's now starting to impact production. And this sort of, this chart shows you how correlated droughts are to a switch over. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, this shows you how uh, droughts are essentially correlated to um, a switch over in a sort of the ENSO index. Um, so the blue line um, essentially shows you drought levels in Indonesia over time. And you'll see that as you enter an El Nino cycle, droughts pick up. And that's what you've essentially started to see um, this year. Now, that also means it will impact rice production. So we have palm oil, we have rice uh, production starting to be affected. So what you see here is an index of drought on a scale of essentially zero to five, but anything above one and a half is essentially above a moderate drought level. And the red line shows you how drought levels for gr rice growing regions um, in Indonesia have been growing rapidly over the past few months. And you're seeing this play out in every major rice producing region. So we've moved from a world where corn and essentially wheat and, and soybeans were affected to now rice and um, palm oil. And then you also are starting to see effects on things like sugar production in places like India, which is not receiving sufficient rainfall. And what that means is India as the second, as the, as the world's largest consumer of um, of, of uh, sugar, but also the second largest exporter of sugar, has started to ban the export of sugar this year to essentially tame inflation domestically. What you see on this map is regions that are white are receiving normal rainfall, red is below normal rainfall, and blue is above normal rainfall. But what you sort of want to understand here is the regions that look red are the regions that are also starting to sort of produce, that produce most of the sugar. So relative to a 10-year average. Now, why I showed a series of these charts is to show that it's already happening now. We're moving from one extreme that affects one set of crops in one set of the world to another extreme. And these extremes are happening more consistently and more frequently than we knew them to happen. And so when we think of climate change, it's not just about things getting warmer everywhere. It's also about our climate getting less predictable, our climate getting more volatile. Now, what does the future hold based on what climate science tells us 
for agriculture and agricultural production. So this map that you see of the world is a map that if you look at the white regions, um, basically that is where nothing major is gonna happen to how arable the land is or is not. If it's not arable, it'll remain not arable. If it's arable, it'll remain arable. Nothing happens. But if you look at the red spots, the red spots are regions that are actually arable and can grow crops today that will not be able to grow crops by 2050. Pink is regions that are able to grow crops today that actually become less arable. Light green is regions that are not arable today, that are um, arable today and actually become a little more arable. And then the dark green are regions we don't farm in today that actually we will be able to farm in because of climate change. Now, when you look at this map, it shows you so many different things. It's a geopolitical map. It's an economic map. Um, it's a map that tells you many stories, but it's also a, a story of migration. You know, what you see in sub-Saharan Africa is a desertification and the Sahara essentially pushing further south. What you see in Russia is regions that are not even populated today that are essentially too cold to farm in will become arable. But there's no infrastructure there to actually start farming in. Um, but India, about, you know, 18% of global rice production in regions that are growing rice today will actually not be able to grow the same type of rice we're growing unless we innovate in sort of rice arability and what that means. Um, when you look at the red regions, that's 880 million people today that live in areas that are farmable that will not be able to farm in these regions if we don't do something different. About half of those people are actually sitting in India. India has been the miraculous story of agricultural production in many ways by becoming self-sufficient through a green revolution. The undoing of a green revolution over the next 25 years is actually something that is completely within the realm of possibility, unless we do something different. And that something different here is actually thinking about innovation in things like seed technology or changing the crops that we're gonna grow to make the land sort of more suitable to the things that we're gonna do it in. Um, we have very, very under sort of have, like under researched regions like India on rice and wheat and wheat production. About 9% of wheat production will also disappear. These are like staple crops for humanity. These are not luxury crops or luxury goods. And so while I say, you know, climate change is today, what it holds for the future if we do not do something for humanity is actually something that is the undoing of decades of um, economic progress. And, you know, like I said, this map tells many different stories, but to me, I look at it and I just see people. And what are people going to do in these regions? Um, what are we going to do about education systems if we're going to have people farm less? Um, what are we going to do about migration to the regions that are, we're going to be able to farm in? Um, what are we going to do about infrastructure to be able to farm? These are 20-year decisions and lots of money that needs to be spent today to change our world for 20 years from now. Um, so with that, I thank you for having me and have a wonderful day.